biar dia kamu susah.
Gitu. Ya, ya. Ya, ya. Ya, ya.
Om Shanti. Bonsoir et bienvenue à tous. A very warm, warm welcome to all our dear brothers and sisters present today. And it gives me immense pleasure to welcome among us a very, very special soul who has come all the way across the Indian Ocean to our little island, our very beloved brother Charles Hogg, whom we lovingly call Charlie Bai, brother Charlie. A warm welcome on behalf of Mauritius, on behalf of Catrabon, this area is part of the island, and on behalf of center coordinator, Sister Mala and Sister Niti. We, are, we feel so honored and we are so pleased to have you. And in a moment we are going to know you and uh, we are going to hear from you and we take the maximum benefit for ourselves, for the soul. But before that, I invite you to join me in a minute of silence. Thank you. Thank you so much. There's one word bringing all of us here together this evening. <coughs> the theme for today's conversation is making the wise shift to a happy life. 
And you'll all join me to agree that that one word that brings all of us here is the word happy, happiness. We all want to be happy. I want to be a happy person. I want to be a happy husband and I want to be a happy father and a mother. I want to be a happy boss and I want to be a happy team member and I want to be a happy citizen of this country. And I think this is what has drawn us and we are going to discover in a moment what is that wise shift we really need to make that happiness happen in our life. Yes, it does happen, but now and then but it doesn't stay with us and we would like that happiness that stays with us and is with us at every step of our life, at every part of our life. So um, I would like to uh, introduce our overseas guest, Charlie Bai, uh, for those who are meeting him for the first time. Maybe some of you have been seeing him, watching him and listening to his classes on YouTube, but uh, it's pro it would be proper to have a proper introduction of Brother Charlie. He has got a very long biodata. But what touches me is that he was the first Westerner to come in contact with the Brahma Kumaris in, the 1970, in 1975. And uh, it's, it's beautiful to have such a soul among us. But I'm going to introduce Bai through this video clip that we're going to view together so that you know him better. So I welcome you to watch the clip.
So welcome, Brother Charlie, to Mauritius. Welcome to the center. And I welcome you now on, up on the stage. So we viewed the video clip and now we are having a glimpse of Charlie Bai. We have an extraordinary soul in front of us. A marvelous uh, soul who has gone through a long spiritual journey. And we can imagine the resources within the soul, the heart, and the vein of this person in front of us and we are going to make the most of this evening's session. Um, Charlie Bai, thank you for being with us. Thank you for, the, for your presence and thank you for your smile. It makes things easy for me on the stage. <laughs> yeah, Charlie Bai, my country needs you. Because my country I can say is unhappy. And I feel it's not only for Mauritius, but it's global. And that's why we picked up the theme, a happy life, because it's happiness that has drawn all of us here. It's happiness that will keep drawing us and pulling us. And um, we all want a solution to all the different forms and kinds of unhappiness we see around us, within us, within our family, our community, our country. And we uh, really expect that through this conversation, we are going to receive insights, lights upon what all those practical tools or ways, that wise shift that we really need to be able to make something for myself, my family, and my country. Uh, we all have a common dream. So we all dream for happiness, a happy world. And yes, we are striving and investing a lot of our time and life to find that happiness, but that stays only for a short while, Nespa. <laughs> Yeah, and we want that happiness that, that we're able to hold on to. And um, can we still keep hoping that ha that kind of happiness we all long for and desire and dream to happen in our life? Uh, first of all, I would like to, uh, to listen from you, to hear from you. What is your own definition of happiness? Maybe we should redefine happiness. If it's that happiness we look for and want to achieve, is that the right definition? Because it's something so subjective. I would like to hear from you. What is uh, your personal definition of happiness? So good afternoon, everyone. It's really a delight to be with you today. And when you said that our country is unhappy, I think I have traveled a lot in my life and just this year I've spent time in Korea, Japan, Philippines, New Zealand and, and you know my sense is Mauritius may be unhappy but it's a little bit better than most of the other places <laughs> quite frankly and I'm not saying that because I'm in Mauritius that's my sense of life but Perhaps I can put it like this. <clears throat> you know, happiness is a word which I think means many things to many different people. But 
To me, there's two main types of happiness. We grow up in a culture where we see happiness as outside. Whereas I think spirituality says happiness is inside. We grow up in a culture where happiness is always temporary. We get a hit of happiness and we come back again. Whereas spirituality really explores a more permanent foundation, a more permanent type of happiness. And we grow up in a world where we seek happiness through our senses. You know, we eat something, we go to the movies, we go to a holiday, and always that is temporary. Whereas I think spirituality explores happiness beyond the senses. And I think for me, I would say that I'm not great on definitions, and I think to define <laughs> such a, a rich quality in just a few words, but to me, happiness is a state of being when I base my life on truth. When I really live a life based on truth, how that truth bubbles into my words, my behavior, my mind, my feelings, it will bring some sense of joy and well-being. So <clears throat> the thing is, I feel today that we have a very superficial attitude towards what happiness really is. So I think it's a good opportunity for all of us to redefine our own personal meaning we give to happiness and maybe redefine the pathway towards that happiness we all long for. So it's a good chance for us to stir our minds and our hearts. What would happiness mean to me? This is a chance to redefine it. So the, spirit, the physical perspective to happiness and the spiritual perspective to happiness. And um, the theme today is the wise shift, making a wise shift towards the way uh, to a happy life. Now, uh, what's that wise shift would like to hear from you? Because I think this is, uh, we're all looking for you know, a, we a new me method, a new way to achieve the happiness we're all longing for. What could be that wise shift? And what has happiness to do with wisdom? Because happiness should be, according to me, something natural, something, you know, it's, it's there. Why should we, you know, think about, or, you know, uh, think about wise ways or think about, you know, work the brain where happiness, we all want to feed it with the heart. What's the connection between, you know, being wise to be happy? You know, in my, my last year at school, um, I did all science subjects, actually, except for one. I did Greek history. I'm not even sure why I studied Greek history. But Socrates once said that wisdom is the supreme art of happiness. And I really love it that, you know, when I absorb truth into my being, how does it come out? Actually, it comes out as happiness. Because often today, you know, we associate wisdom with a very intellectual sort of concept. And then what is unhappiness? It is unhappiness the ultimate form of ignorance? Is it saying to me that it's ignorance? And to me, I think unhappiness is a message in life that somewhere I lack wisdom. I lack some truth to understand how to manage life in certain ways. Even Aristotle, I don't know why I'm remembering this Greek, <laughs> Aristotle said happiness is the meaning and purpose of human life. The ultimate human experience is to be happy. And yet I think <clears throat> the sort of happiness we have today, I sometimes say that, feel that there's different styles of happiness which we all explore. There's the fizzy drink style. You know the fizzy drink style of happiness? Happiness, you bubble up and go flat really quickly. That is the sensual happiness. That is the culture of our world. There's the happiness I call the mask, you know, where you wear a happy face. You know, with other people you're laughing and joking and let inside you feel absolutely heavy, miserable and unhappy. There's a third type I call the because syndrome. And that is really 
conditional happiness. I can't be happy because of my boss. I, just, I can't be happy because of a family situation. I can't be happy because I don't have something I want. There is always a reason to be unhappy. And even I'd say relative happiness, and it's a, a difficult thing to talk about in one way that sometimes, even though we don't feel happy, we watch the news at night, we see people worse off than me, so I don't feel so bad about my situation. It's like, so the happiness of this world is really, I would say, conditional, superficial, temporary, relative. But what we're delving into, we're trying to shift from that happiness culture to really a happiness based on truth. And for me, in my life, <clears throat> there's probably three things that underpin happiness for me. The first is to have a loving relationship with myself as a soul. And I've spent 48 years of my life researching who I am, how to reconnect with myself, and build a sort of a platform of self-value, which has really helped me a lot. Secondly, a loving relationship with God. And from that relationship with myself, I feel peace. From the relationship with God, I feel love. But the third thing I feel <clears throat> is benevolence. And I really feel intrinsic part of a quality human life is to give. And you know, my observation of genuinely happy people, they're the givers. They give love, they give respect, they give cooperation. And what happens is life, the law of life says, you know, as you sow, so you reap. Most of the time they receive the blessings from the hearts of many of that, that love, that peace, that goodwill that they're sharing. And so for me, I think that when we build a foundation of things which always exist, to me, true happiness is basing my life on things which always exist. It's a solid foundation for building more happiness in my life, regardless of things happening around me. Because when I build a foundation internally, then as much as things change around me, it doesn't affect me as much. Mm -hmm. uh, can I, I want to ask you, is it easy to do? <laughs> is it easy? Not getting much response. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone feels, well, you know, these things sound okay, but to do them in practical, yeah. So I'll try to be the voice of my audience and the voice of my country. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it's true that uh, we are aware that there is a happiness that we derive from the external world. And you compare it or you're, you know, you're, you're, you're comparing it to the bubble experience of happiness or the, you know, the conditional happiness. And on the other side, you're talking about the wise shift of basing our happiness on that inner foundation, that spiritual foundation of, of our eternity, of what already exists in us. And yet we are living in a physical world. Yes, we understand that inside uh, we have a spiritual existence and we are all spiritual beings, but we are on this material world and, and we're exposed through media, through news, through, you know, what's happening around us, close to us, far, far away from us. We're exposed to all that is happening natural calamities, uh, you know, famine, COVID, now we have another upsurge of COVID in our island since a few weeks. And you see, you, you hear wars, though we don't have any kind of physical war taking place here, but we're surrounded. And uh, while we're exposed to that, uh, sometimes we forget that, that, that eternal, you know, foundation you're talk, talking about. And the, the scenario out there, the influence out there enters our mind and disturbs our mind to such an extent that we completely get lost and we become confused and we, we disconnect to that foundation you're talking about, that happiness that is there, uh, that eternal thing within us. 
so uh, what do we do? Uh, should we just focus on ourselves and I create my inner happiness and create my own state of being through spiritual practices and remain indifferent to what is happening there? And I pretend to be happy while the world around me is unhappy, while the person next to me is unhappy and disturbed and in, in stress and in depression. How do I make that practical? How do I make, make it out? That was quite a question, wasn't it? <laughs> um, <clears throat> you know, I would say that, you know, we are all spiritual people, and when we see our brothers and sisters in the world suffering, none of us love to see suffering, and we can have absolute empathy for others, but still retain my happiness. Does it help other people if I lose my happiness because of their suffering? I don't think it helps me at all. Um, and I think that our habit is always to be influenced by the external world because there's sort of a, a spiritual law that says when I feel empty, I look to feel my emptiness from outside. So what that really means is, <clears throat> you know, I sometimes think of the mind like a vacuum cleaner. And so I look to you to give me love. I take that. I look to you to give me respect. I take that. Look to you to cooperate with me. I take that. But then you may insult me. I take that. You criticize me. I take that. It's like we absorb everything from the external world and then we blame the external world for my lack of happiness. But what spirituality teaches us is to live in this world. And in a sense, I'm not seeking what I need from out there. I'm taking it fundamentally from my relationship with God. So I'm absolutely present in this world. I'm contributing to people. And I can say from my own self in my life that when I started, I was quite sensitive to everybody's ups and downs and moods and their opinions of me. But I feel less and less affected by it now. And actually, I think it makes you more effective in life. So in other words, you can see what's happening. You have compassion and empathy for it. But it doesn't control how you feel inside. It's like you develop more self-control rather than feeling you're like a cork on the ocean dancing to the tune of all the situations in the world which most people are feeling at the moment. And I think what, what spirituality does, it builds an internal foundation that is solid and isn't controlled by all the moods of the world at the moment, all the changes in the economy, the politics, the society, the technology. It's absolutely possible. But the thing is, I feel that we have to be consistent in a practice. And it's almost like you begin to practice how to rebuild my inner resilience to face life. And a part of that is you can remain light and happy. It's not that if other people are suffering, you are showing you're sort of laughing and joking. Not at all. Happiness is an internal state. And honestly, if we all think about our lives, when we're around somebody who is light and warm and happy, they uplift spirits. And then when that sort of person is around in really bad circumstances, when problems are happening, we love to have that personality who's light and happy. It uplifts all our spirits and enables us to face the situations we have to face. True. So, um so if I build my own inner state uh, of happiness and peace and the one I want to be inside, um, it uh, doesn't mean that I have to, uh, you know, run away or be indifferent or, you know, uh, not be the out there. Some, sometimes we feel that, you know, peace and happiness, these are jargons, you know, belonging to that some, a group of people who have nothing to do and who are indifferent and or 
you know, like on a path of isolation. And that happiness that Brother Charlie is talking about is not for us because we live in the world and we have to face all these things. And this is just for a category of people. But then um, uh, what you are trying to explain to us is that being that I build for myself, using that truth and that wisdom, I can use that uh, to face the world out there and not absorb and be disturbed by the disturbance out there. But how do I make it practical? It's easy, uh, it's easy to understand the theory. But uh, how do I make it practical so that I'm out there surrounded by all these storms and things that can make me unhappy, you know, like anything? And how can I maintain my, my inner state and maintain my, my state of of remaining content? You know, we all have the habit, all of us, of being sensitive to everything outside. So people's behavior, situations, world news impacts our moods. Because that's the culture we've all grown up with. We're, we're very high, you know, easily influenced by the external world. But spirituality is about building an inner platform on that which always exists. And firstly, to have a relationship with myself as the soul. And that relationship with God. And the result of those two relationships, which are really real, is that I'm going to use a word which I know sometimes people find a little bit challenging. It makes me, I would call, detached and loving. And so you're living in this world, but you're less influenced by this world. And I especially use the word loving because I think in the, in the English language, detached is the most misunderstood word. It fundamentally means I'm loving, I'm caring, I'm close, I'm connecting, I'm communicating, but I'm not influenced. And what happens is when I really build that inner foundation, I become a natural observer of life rather than an absorber. If I'm absorbing everything, my inner world goes up and down, up and down, according to everything happening in this unstable world. It's impossible for us to be happy and stable. But when I've built the foundation within myself, I more observe it and actually when you observe it, you're still aware of people's feelings and I think more effective in really responding to people's feelings. And so a natural consequence when you build the inner foundation is that you feel less affected by things, though therefore I feel you're more effective in helping people, supporting people, caring for people. You know, sometimes I've heard people say that when a little child gets seriously ill, Sometimes a nurse is more effective than the mother because the mother feels so worried and anxious about the child, <laughs> that vibration. But the nurse is a little bit detached in that way, but still actually loving and effective in that situation. Is that the wisdom you want to... Pardon? Put? Is that the wisdom you want to, you know, convey to our audience today? That wisdom of, you know, of the nurse <laughs> <laughs> instead of the wisdom of the mother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, you have been on a long spiritual journey of over 40 years. Uh, you're talking about, you know, building that base, that strong base, and basing your truth on that strong inner base and not absorbing or getting influenced by the external uh, things happening. But it does happen at least to me several times and I believe others on spiritual journeys, on their own spiritual journeys would agree to me, that there comes a moment where despite all the practice and all the attention and all the care and all the love, it so happens that things come in front of you and you get back to the old habit of absorbing. And then you have to struggle, you know, to gain, be loving and detached, be the observer. And it takes such a long time, you know, to throw that thrash, <laughs> you know, out of, of yourself, out of your mind. Um, 
I would like to personally ask you, do you, uh, are you, I don't know what stage you've reached on your journey, but does it happen to you that sometimes, you know, things come in and the old habit just emerges and then you absorb that and what do you do now to take that out? <laughs> because yeah. we all get influenced and get disturbed and lose our happiness, then what do we do? <laughs> Yes, of course, you know, but I would say 95% less than when I started all that time ago. And it's freedom, actually. It's freedom when you sort of feel more st stable. But I had a little saying for myself for many years that only my ego accepts sorrow. So if I'm being hurt by something, it means the false self is ruling my inner system. I'm being deceived by my... It's my ego that feels insulted, disrespected, not hurt. What it means is that I'm not really in that real state of self-awareness. So rather than projecting back out there, I want to look at myself and see how I can improve. But I used to sometimes feel that most of us have a PhD in taking sorrow. You know, we're experts. <laughs> You know, it's such a deep, deep habit that we have because of the culture, if I would say, of forgetting who I am. This body conscious culture means that peace, love and happiness is all outside. And so because I'm looking and when I get peace and happiness, I feel high. But any other thing that comes my way, criticism, insult, disrespect, I take it deeply. And then the blame game begins, you know, this whole cycle goes of, of life, feeling hurt, blaming, projecting, gossiping about it. It's a recipe to feel quite unhappy. And what spirituality really says is that, okay, <clears throat> begin the journey of building the inner foundation. And this inner foundation is so spiritually powerful. When I does not know I experience the reality that I'm an eternal soul, an eternal soul. And I have not just a belief in God, I have a living relationship with God. The power you receive from that means that you really, it gives you such a, a super sensuous happiness, I would say. You know, when I meditate in the morning, <clears throat> what I love to do is sit down and literally withdraw from the temporary self and all the labels. And I sit lightly in the forehead as the eternal point. And that gift, the more I become soul conscious, this whole fragrance of, it's not even peace, it's deep calmness, silence. And it's like a feeling of coming home to a place where I really belong. And then as a little child, I love to become like a little child I sit in front of God as light and allow myself to be completely loved. And honestly, the joy I feel from that lasts a lot of the day. And even if other things aren't so good, that joy is always with me, that happiness. Now, I do go into the world sometimes and things happen and I still get affected. But the more I practice that platform building it's like my foundation in myself spiritually. I'm less and less influenced by things out there. And it takes time. No one should pretend it doesn't take time. But it's a real platform. And in time, I can maintain my happiness, even when there's circumstances around me that aren't so good. And that doesn't mean when other people are suffering, you're sort of really expressing. No, it's just an inner state. And you will be showing your absolute compassion and concern for their welfare. But it doesn't mean I have to surrender my feeling. Because I'd say the ultimate state of wisdom is to maintain my happiness regardless of external situations. Yeah. And, you know, this is the spiritual journey. And as you learn, you learn and then you, you know, it's, like, it's not like that. It's a, <laughs> it's a learn. But it, to me, there's... It's the greatest thing in life to be on this journey back to my truth so I can really know happiness in life. And I love that experience that you're relating about becoming the child because the child has no labels and 
no mask and no PhD, so really shedding, you know, of all these masks and these hats and these labels and becoming that a child, that, mm. that innocence. Mm. And I think this is a state where I, I'm, I'm connected to my truth and, and uh, that enables me to get connected to that supreme truth and, you know, receive that energy from him. Um, we have been talking about the external influence of the, of the world and be the observer and not the absorber. <coughs> Sometimes there are issues, you know, within ourselves, things of the past, especially hurts of, you know, the past. Some of the hurts are there, we're aware, and some of the hurts are there, we're unaware why they're here, why they're there. And they keep, you know, emerging and disturbing our peace of mind and stealing away our happiness. It has nothing to do with the external situation of the world, with people we work with, live with but it has something to do with my own past. So how do I deal with that? Because it's deep inside and yet maintain my truth, maintain my, my inner contentment, my, my state I so much cherish. You know, I think that's a really fascinating question because you know how in life you're traveling along quite well and something triggers some sadness inside you or a lack of a loss of confidence or an anxiety or a, a self-doubt. And it's maybe an innocuous comment from somebody or you, you don't do so well at something and it just triggers this sort of internal self-doubt or even self-dislike sometimes. And when I began my meditation journey, I was living in London. And when I was introduced to who I was as a soul, in fact, the soul is an overname for three aspects of consciousness. The mind, which is, I often think, like a screen. So all the data from your sense organs, what you see, what you hear, what you speak, is thrown up on the screen. The intellect, the second part, assesses all the data. So as you're even listening today, there's a part of you assessing everything that we're saying. I agree with that, I don't agree with that. The intellect makes a decision, we, we decide to do something, we do an action. And every single action is recorded in the subconscious. The absolute wonder of the human spirit is that all of us sitting here so quietly today carry a perfect record of our past story in our subconscious. And in that past story, we have incredible beauty, capacity to be so loving and kind, but also my karmic story is sitting there. And when I forget who I am, and I become body conscious, and I do actions under the influence of ego and this sort of thing, I have a recording of deaf habits in my subconscious, habits of fear. Fear is one of the main recordings of my subconscious. Insecurity, lack of self-respect. And so they're sitting in my subconscious and a scene of life comes and that scene somehow it's like breaks open that feeling that emotion sitting in your memory track and it just flows through your mind and a seemingly innocuous few words from somebody or scene just makes you go into so much upheaval and you lose your happiness but I think just understanding that process that as a soul, I do carry my past. And one of the main aspects of the spiritual journey is to really be honest that this is my past and the reason I'm here, I'm starting to clean it up. Through love for God and wisdom, I'm starting to clean out the past story because it's like a shadow over my present. And when you were talking about unhappiness, you know how sometimes there's nothing wrong in life? You know, everything's reasonably okay. And you wake up in the morning, you feel flat. You feel empty. You feel nothing. You know? Why? Because that's the weight of your karmic story of the past. It's just sitting there. And I would say there's the short-term thing of knowing who I am, remembering God. But in the long term, to really clear the backlog of habitual patterns in my subconscious that are like a shadow over my present, and especially fear. 
a lot of my karmic story manifests as fear. And where there's fear, there's no joy. I'm always anxious about outcomes, results. And you know, I think the big question in everyone's minds in the world today is what will happen? What will happen to me? What will happen to my family? What will happen to the economy? What will happen? What will happen? And this is, you know, one lady in Australia, she comes to our center, she's a psychotherapist. She said, the data in all countries is that anxiety is exponential. It's just going through the roof. Because all of us are feeling uncertain about the future and that destroys happiness without a doubt. Mm. And I heard you in one of your big classes sharing that, you know, in the near future, maybe we're already there, that out of every four person on this planet, one is going to go through depression. And I think that that fear and that anxiety lead us to, and the country today is facing this huge new COVID of depression. We get so many cases of depression at all our meditation centers, and they are being recommended by psychiatrists and psychologists. And uh, we all fear whether, you know, maybe I would be the next victim of all this you know, fear and anxiety, and, and, and we have that fear of, you know, of our own health, and how can we, uh, you know, keep ourselves safe from that thing called fear and, and anxiety and, and the fear of going through depression, because we witness so many depressed people around but, us. <coughs> you know, Rika Ben, I think that um, it's, you know, look, to me, all this, I often look at it is that there's a sort of like a, um, a huge, what can we say, uh, disaster in the soul of humanity. And when it manifests to the surface, we put labels on it, we call it stress, depression, anxiety. There's something fundamentally wrong inside all of us. There's a culture we've created. And the seed of that is to me, stress, they'll say stress is about change, but when you go to the heart of stress, it's because I've built my life on falsehood, the fundamental falsehood that I'm a temporary body. I'm more than that, I'm a permanent soul. Now, 80% of us believe I'm a soul, but we still practice, we think in the way that I'm a temporary body, so I fear death, I fear this, I fear so many things. And that falsehood has permeated each part of life and society. And so depression, you know, in psychology, depression is like a sadness that my dream in life to be loved and valued hasn't happened. But in spirituality, depression is like a mourning for the loss of my true identity. I'm living my life, but who am I really? Am I just this, these temporary labels? Or am I something more? Intellectually, we all believe I'm something more, but we don't experience it. And what meditation does, it helps me move from the intellectual understanding to tasting the feeling of being soul conscious. And that seed begins to open the door to happiness, a more permanent state of happiness, just sowing the seed of the truth of who I am. Um, because... In a depression, I feel, you know, the World Health Organization says that one in four human beings is suffering from depression. Personally, I feel it's much higher. It, because, you know, how do we live our life? We sort of, we're bored, we have our families. What's the whole purpose? You know, what's the ultimate aim of life? And this is as Socrates and as Aristotle said, is to be happy. And you can only be happy when I base my life on things that are true, who I am and who I belong to, that relationship with God. Trying to get happiness from material things will never bring me happiness. I, I sometimes share in Australia, I gave a meditation course to a man, a self-made billionaire. And you know what he said to me? He said... I've been a complete success out there and a total failure in here. And I said, why? He said, I'm not happy. I'm not happy. 
Because even though all of us know material things don't bring us happiness, we're caught up in that game. We're still playing that game because we don't know anything else really. We're still sort of seeking material things. It's a known fact when people are depressed, what do they do? Shop. <laughs> I'm serious. Because we get a Trying little high, a we get a little high out of a something new, a material thing, but to fill in the gap inside. To fill the emptiness yeah. inside. Yeah. Yeah. And it's true because you shared about love. We're all seekers of love and we all fear that, you know, rejection when people are unable to to give us the love we seek and we feel like uh, totally disturbed and all happiness gone. And we're facing more and more this this phenomenon of being rejected by our close one, by our partners, by our subordinates, superiors and inferiors at work. And I think that too is a major cause to depression or anxiety or fear of being rejected by the other because we seek love for, from each other. And it, it is becoming so more and more difficult, you know, to share our love with each other, which is, which is a, a nature, a natural, you know, gift. So why that difficulty of, you know, just loving each other and sharing our love mm. <laughs> instead of rejection? <laughs> you know, <clears throat> I think to reject another human being is the sort of ultimate act of violence in a way. All of us know there's nothing more painful because I think in our DNA we want to belong and if someone just completely rejects me, it's one of the most painful human experiences. But I often feel there's three sources of love from myself, from God, and from my family and friends. And because in today's world, not much love coming from me for me. And in fact, I think that's one of the reasons the world is in its state is that first relationship is so damaged. In fact, often we give each other we give the self very negative self-talk. You're hopeless, you're no good, you're inferior. So that relationship's not so good. God, many have faith in God, but I'm not sure I really feel tangible, real, love. intimate love. And so my one source of love is family and friends. So if there's a loss in the family, someone dies, or if um, there's a conflict and there's a a, a relationship breaks it. It's like my whole life falls apart. Yeah, it's like divorce. What or death. is spirituality? I would say spirituality is first having a loving relationship with myself as a soul, and secondly, a loving relationship with God, the Supreme Soul. And that platform of love, when I build that platform, it's a platform that I can really have loving feelings for others. And really, my own feeling is the most beautiful human life, the highest quality human life, is to be in love with God and to be an instrument to give love to others. Whether they want it or not, I keep loving. You know, whether people, because you know human beings, we do the business of love. If you love me, I'll love you. But I think, Really expressing love makes me so mentally, emotionally, and spiritually healthy when I do. When your heart's full from God, it's a natural consequence of that. And I think so much happiness boils down to rebuilding a living relationship with God. I often think of God as the lover of the soul. And I think... You know, we pray to God, we believe in God, but when I really, really have a living, loving relationship like the love of the soul, that love builds extraordinary power within myself so that even if someone rejects me, I don't take it to heart. Even if someone puts me down, I don't take it to heart. These things don't knock me over like they used to before. Because I am resourcing myself from that yeah. elevated form of love from God. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Maybe I'll uh, uh, now open uh, the floor to, to you, dear 
brothers and sisters, if you have any question for Charlie Bhatt. Okay, the mic will come to you. Would you please? Would you keep, please come in front and take the mic? Om Shanti, ladies and gentlemen. Om Shanti. Uh, I would like to ask you a question. Like you said that we are connected to God and uh, we have to live, seek for our inner happiness. So in short, I would like to know, like uh, what I understood, that we should not have any kind of um, expectations from anybody so that we can really solidify our soul and our happiness. Am I right? Um, Thank you. <laughs> yes, I think that, um, you know, sometimes in this journey to really feel love, we have high expectations of how other people should love me. And you know, some people I've noticed are permanently disappointed in other people. No one can live up to their expectations. So they see it as other people, but they don't realize actually their expectations are the problem. Because I think, you know, we're at a time in history, if I can say, the human soul's very depleted, it's weak. It doesn't have that much to offer. And I really feel we can be highly judgmental of each other, which unfortunately most of us are extremely critical and judgmental, mainly often because that's how we are with ourselves. Or we can have compassion. I think when you feel close to God, you can have compassion. Because I feel, you know when you, you remember God, and this is a really natural relationship and I often think that just as I am a soul, now you can see me, can't you? Because I'm expressing through my body. I'm speaking, and, but I'm a soul actually. God is a soul, a thinking, pulsating, real conscious being, but without a human form. As real as I am, but I'm sitting in a human form to express, God doesn't have it. And so when I build a quality relationship with that soul, how do I do that? It's not through speech and sense organs, it's through just my thoughts and my feelings. It's a whole different dynamic, but just as real. And as much as I get strong in that relationship, I feel almost automatically I have a more compassionate vision for people around me. And you know, to be honest, sometimes I think you know, we have centres, the Brahma Kumaris have centres in 130, 40 countries of the world. And people flock to those centres. And I think most people at any stature of life are struggling internally at the moment. Life's not easy for anybody. And so to offer an understanding, listen to them and have compassion, you know, reduce our expectations that everyone should fulfill how I feel you should behave and, you know, and not be affected by their bad behaviour. It takes practice, there's no doubt. But you know when you see beyond the behaviour, you see the soul, you have compassion for the soul, that is such a gift for another person. Because most people feel, usually they're judged by others and they can feel that judgement and criticism. But if I offer genuine love, that is a huge gift. And how can I offer love when I feel the love myself from God? My heart's full, I can share with others. And I, many of you in this room have known a lot of the elder sisters of the Brahma Kumaris, whom we call the Dadis. And they were, all of them, extraordinarily loving. Kept loving, kept loving, kept loving. How can I do that when I keep feeling loved by God? You've got an unending stream of love to share with others, yeah. Thank you, sister, for the question. I hope it has become clearer for you. Anybody else? Anybody has a question for our brother? Regarding the topic we are talking about, happiness. Yes, please. Can you please come forward? Okay. Om Shanti 
you very much. First, I would like to congratulate you a wonderful conversation in front of a very pleasant audience. Can you just hold the mic? Yeah. Up? Thank you. Yeah, Charlie Bai. You know, we are all living in a very complicated and difficult world. Disrupted by the pandemic the last three years. And today we are, uh, that all these effects are on us, on our daily life, in our job, in our shopping, in the price of goods and services, education, in all sectors. The world is, we are living in a highly material world, as you explained earlier. The word uh, happiness, as you and sister commented, it's very, very important. At times, I think that our happiness may be the sadness for others and vice versa. Nobody, we are all human beings, we are emotional. Your, maybe your close ones, your colleagues, people, other people will not be happy if you are happy. It's like this in many societies. Do you think that happiness, we, we create it, it does not come in our life automatically? You have mentioned some ways how to create it through meditation, your connection with God, all that. But uh, very few people in this world, in our society, are happy because it's difficult to attain such a level of happiness you are talking about. Do you yes. think that we have to change completely our mindset? Do you think that uh, we have uh, uh, to do more efforts? We have to clean our past, as you rightly said. Do you think that we should redefine ourselves? Try to understand us ourselves more. For me, happiness is very complicated. Your comments, please. <laughs> <laughs> so many questions in one question. <laughs> Thank you, Mai. Thank you. I'll do my best to <laughs> keep him happy. So. <laughs> um, no, it's, it's really absolutely true what you say. And you know, in life, I choose where I live. I choose a career. I choose a partner. Do I choose happiness? Spirituality says I choose happiness. Actually, I choose happiness by the actions I create. And the whole path of spirituality is choosing happiness by knowing myself, having a relationship with God, and doing quality actions. Because when my consciousness is high, the seed of my, the motive, the intent in my action is to bring happiness to others. So the law of karma says, I create my own destiny. Whoever I am is my own creation. So when I really do actions according to truth, then my actions are starting to build a life of happiness for myself. You know, <clears throat> in the Brahma Kumaris, we have an understanding of time. The time moves in cycles. And what that really means is it's all about the soul, the human soul. The human soul is like a little battery. And when it's full, then all our actions bring happiness. At the beginning of time, we were full. 
But as we began to forget who I was, do actions based on the consciousness of my body, my actions are colored by ego, by anger, by greed. And the ultimate result is what we see in the world at the moment, a very unhappy world, such a superficial life. And so we've lost all our happiness. The soul is depleted. It's lost its spiritual power. And that means it's lost peace, love, and happiness. Most people feel that. And what we see is this is the time to replenish myself. How? With a relationship with God. That's the real key, I would say. Not just happiness, but peace and love is not a devotional relationship with God, but a living relationship, like I said, with a real living conscious being. And I personally have seen people, when they really connect, when I, the soul, connect with God in a real living way, the whole face changes. It's a most beautiful thing. Light comes back in the face again. Joy comes back in the face again. Because it's like the awareness is triggered once more. And I think what the call of time is saying to all of us, we have to now rebuild. And I think it is a complete sort of change of mindset, to be honest, that happiness is not out there. It's temporary. There is happiness, but it's temporary. If I want more permanent happiness, I have to look to the internal resources. And that's really what the message from the world at the moment. The more I try to get it from out there, the more unstable I will feel. And um, yeah, it, it takes patience. <laughs> but you know, <clears throat> in Australia, we have four live-in retreat centers. And every single weekend of the year, groups of people like you come and what we all say to them every time is that, okay, they're starting meditation. Try it every day for three months and see how you feel. Because, you know, we come to the talk and we start, oh, I'm busy, I've got to do this. So we just go back into our old patterns once again. And yet, more important than anything in life is my own well-being. Because when I'm happy, when I'm peaceful, I'm going to be a much nicer husband, wife, parent, child, whatever it may be. We need to give time. And many people find that when they practice for a few months, they really start to get the connection. And it really starts to change my whole perception of me, my life, and really what's important in life. Mm. Yes, thank you, brother. I think you've wrapped up everybody's question in your one question, <laughs> this series of questions. Yes. And brother has so wisely, you know, replied to to you and I believe to everybody else. I'm watching the clock and we need to complete in time because you will have to uh, make your way back home. So uh, may I invite now Brother Charlie to lead us into that loving connection you've been talking uh, about since the beginning of this conversation and all through the conversation. I, I believe all the questions that we've been pulling you the word love and the word relationship with self and the loving relationship with God has been mentioned and I believe this is the wise shift that we all need to be able to, you know, catch hold of that experience of happiness and make our life happy. And it does no good, you know, to the world when I'm unhappy, when the world is unhappy. So please you embark us into a few minutes of connection with the ultimate truth. I'm happy to, Sister Rick, but there was one lady who wanted to ask a question, and we... we you had a question? Yeah. Thank you. So, um, good evening, everyone. Um, I had two things. First was um, the definition of happiness, where you mentioned that the way that we take in the reality it would be um, what we will be gaining as happiness. So this one is very um, triggering for me um, in terms of um, how do we see the positivity in the reality um, to take in. My question then becomes on the second part where you mentioned um, to leave behind the past um, to it. 
So how would you recommend to, um, I would use the word detached, uh, to be detached from the past, and to focus on the reality, taking in the positivity? You know, <clears throat> I think that, um, you know, some psychologists say that 70% of our thinking is about the past. Because the past for many of us has been quite hurtful and painful, and the mind dwells on it, that's a recipe to be unhappy. And I think that when I begin to a spiritual journey, there's probably two factors. Once I begin to know who I am and have a relationship with God, I begin to see that many of my behaviors, my actions in the past were done under the influence when I wasn't really aware of certain things. But secondly, I think I need to forgive, firstly, myself and others, because, you know, when I lose self-awareness, I'm under the influence of many factors, fear, ego, lack of self-respect, anger. We do actions that really create problems, mainly in human relationships. And so I need to, forgive myself because sometimes if I don't forgive myself that that really um, really negative attitude or this um, very judgmental attitude I have to myself it frees me when I forgive myself and I can even forgive others if I don't I like I I'm holding on to resentment anger and pain and unfortunately half the world is doing that at the moment it's like a huge shadow over the world that we just, the past is, people feel so resentful. And I think, well, how can I do it? As you've heard tonight, everything rests on a relationship with God. When you feel loved by God, genuinely, you feel, why am I holding on to this stuff? It just creates absolute misery and pain in my life. And when you, I think it's possible to say, because a lot of people say, but it wasn't right. And if I forgive, I'm saying that what you did was okay. But I think it's possible to say, for my peace of mind, I'm going to let go. I don't agree with the behavior. They're not my values. But I now prioritize my peace of mind. And I free myself from the pain of the past. It's actually freeing myself. It's an incredible thing to do. It's such an important thing. And that starts to open up a lot more happiness. And if I understood the first question, I'm not sure I did. <laughs> My understanding of happiness, I was really saying that um, happiness is a state of being based on truth. That when I build a foundation of truth, that I'm an eternal soul. And I'm basing my life on that which always exists rather than temporary things. It's a shift. It's the wise shift to shift from a foundation of temporary, my temporary identity, to my permanent identity. And this is really what meditation teaches me, how to build that foundation in myself of stability. So that, and it's not going to happen overnight, but steadily, steadily, I feel lighter, happier, and better. I'm, I'm not sure I grabbed your first question accurately. She was appreciating your definition. Oh, thank you. The second part was appreciation. The oh, second I'm so part sorry. Was I couldn't hear quite clearly. Thank you. Thank you, sister. <clears throat> so, so let us enjoy yeah, some. So Brother Charlie is going now to guide us into a short meditation. <coughs> Um, maybe in some cases, in some cases, but mostly it's me letting go the attachment to something that happened or my perception of something that's happened. And um, really forgiveness can release myself from a lot of pain internally. 
It's not an easy thing to do because my ego holds on. You've done this. This has happened. It's my ego. And as you meditate more, in a way, soul consciousness is gently, gently becoming more egoless. And almost automatically, all those things which I felt so much insult, only my ego takes insult. If I'm soul conscious, I don't feel insulted even if someone is rude to me. So it's like I'm really taking back my sense of self. And that seed changes most aspects of my life. So I think we'll wind up with the Q&A part and let's embark on the meditation part. <clears throat> so I would like to invite everybody to, if you feel comfortable, keep your eyes open and gently rest your vision to the image of the Supreme Soul, the image of light. And I will just offer a few thoughts, not just to listen to, but to feel and experience. Let me begin the wise shift, a movement towards a happier life. By building a foundation internally, is stable, and gives me a permanent happiness. Visualize yourself as a minute spark of life energy. residing in the front of the brain, in the center of the forehead. Just hold this image of I, the soul, the permanent self, the tiny point of consciousness. Just gently feel how I'm beyond all the labels of my body. My wonderful body is temporary and I am permanent. The more I become soul conscious, I naturally receive the gift of true peace. Peace is my natural state. I am a peaceful soul. of who I am is the first step of the wise shift to a happier life. And then in this state of soul consciousness, look through the eye of your mind 
visualize the eternal form of God. A beautiful radiant jewel of light emanating divine love, a purity of love you will find nowhere else. This love is real. I'm connecting with a real being. And allow yourself to be completely loved. Feel the shower of this divine love entering the core of your being. Open yourself consciously and feel this love, this respect this belonging, it's like coming home to a quality of love that brings the greatest happiness amongst all happiness. To feel truly loved and true belonging that only God can give me. And this connection is only a thought away. I can have this connection to this true happiness whenever I want. This is the second step of the wise shift. And if I decide that I will give it a go, every morning I wake and before I think what I have to do, what happened yesterday, sit quietly, connect with my true self, connect with God, fill myself with happiness and inner strength, and then carry that into my day. It's absolutely possible it just needs practice. To meditate regularly is an act of love for myself. Thank you so much, Charlie Bai, for taking us, all of us, on this beautiful journey of what we've been talking about, the Y shift, from the external to the internal, and then from what is grounded here to the one above, and the choice. We've been choosing our families, our careers, our you know education, what about choosing for happiness now? Let's make happiness our choice. And Charlie Bai, one word mantra as takeaway to our beautiful audience. 
um, <coughs> give happiness and receive happiness. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Let's accept this gift from the sky through by to all of us and keep sharing that to the whole of our country to make our country a much happier place to live. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Charlie, for all that you have been sharing with us and the takeaway gift and mantra that we take away sweet too. <laughs> and thank you, dear brothers and sisters, our guests, for being with us. And uh, I hope you've taken a lot of benefit from this evening's session. Om Shanti. So Bhai will be sharing um, special prashad sweets with you. Uh, so the sisters are going to guide.